And of course, the Constitution has been effectively destroyed. There really are no constitutional limits on the growth of government anymore. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano in his book, The Constitution in Exile, uh, noted that not a single federal law was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court from 1937 to 1995. The only time Republicans talk about the Constitution is whenever they want to use it to block something the Democrats are trying to do. And the only time you ever hear a Democrat in Congress talking about the Constitution is when they want to try to use it to block something the Republicans are trying to do at the moment. But nobody believes in, in using it as a, as a limit on governmental power. I thought it would be useful to uh, try to tell the story of how this came about and why, why the Constitution had to be destroyed uh, based on some of my uh, uh, research in economic history. This was a, a statement by um, the late Murray Rothbard in one of his books uh, about uh, the very beginning of the American Republic, about the very, very beginning of the American Republic. There always were the two factions in American politics. You had the nationalists who wanted a powerful central government uh, they would be very active and, and do all, all sorts of bad things. And then you had the Jeffersonian wing, uh, the decentralists who wanted limited decentralized government, limited taxation, uh, and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, we've, throughout the whole history of the country, we've had a, a back and forth battle between the nationalists and the centralizers on the one hand, and the decentralizers and the more libertarian wing of, of American politics on the other. And here is how Rothbard described the nationalists. And of course, uh, Alexander Hamilton has always been looked at as the intellectual leader of the so-called nationalists of that time. What were they about? What did they want uh, at the beginning of the Republic when the American Revolution ended? Here's what they wanted according to uh, Rothbard. They wanted, quote, I'm quoting, to, to reimpose in the new, new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. That's Murray Rothbard. And Alexander Hamilton actually uh, labeled this system the American system. And how's that for Orwellian double, double talk? He wanted a clone of the British mercantilist system that the revolution had just been fought against, and they wanted to call it the American system. And so you, if you break this down, what did they want? A, a centralized state where political power was uh, totally centered in, uh, in the federal government, heavy federal taxes and debt, discriminatory taxes, high tariff would be a discriminatory tax, and the original constitution prohibited discriminatory taxation altogether. They wanted corporate welfare run amok, essentially, and aggressive militarism. Does any of that sound familiar to anybody? Uh, could you, what, what, what country might you describe that is characterized today by these things uh, that, that you, might be, you might be familiar with? Of course, that's our system today. And so uh, I'm going to argue that that was uh, why the Constitution had to be destroyed. A, a very long, decades-long campaign or crusade had to be waged in a lot of different areas, in the courts, in politics, and elsewhere, to, uh, to destroy the Constitution so that this would be allowed, so that this would uh, uh, come, in, come into being. And uh, at the beginning of the American Republic, the, the, uh, the proponents of this, of course, were the Hamiltonians, Hamilton himself, uh, people such as uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, Marshall Joseph, Justice Joseph Story, a Supreme Court Justice, uh, Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, and Abraham Lincoln. Those were the nationalists up until the Civil War era. The opponents of all this were the Jeffersonians. Jefferson himself, Madison, Monroe, Andrew Jackson, President John Tyler, and, and people of that sort. And, and there was a, a very large uh, uh, battle that went on, okay? 
And so you have to understand a little bit of the history of this in, in that um, uh, Hamilton himself, when he, when he attended the Constitutional Convention, he did uh, propose a permanent president who would appoint all the governors. So this was, this was the first salvo in this decade-long political battle to, uh, to essentially uh, achieve a centralized monopolistic state. And the centralized monopolistic state was always tied to an economic agenda. It was a tied to that economic agenda that I just, just mentioned, the so-called American system. And of course, the reason why they wanted it is uh, the same reason why the King of England wanted it. He enriched himself and his friends with it at the expense of everybody else, but it was a way to enrich the politically connected and the elite uh, you know, uh, uh, who supported the government. And of course, uh, when, when Hamilton and his uh, cronies did not get their way, Hamilton himself uh, denounced the Constitution as a frail and worthless fabric. The convention attendees viewed the Constitution as a compact among the free and independent states and not the creation of a national government. It was proposed and seconded to erase the word national, so somebody did propose this, and substitute the words United States in the plural uh, in the fourth resolution, which passed in the affirmative. Thus, we see an opinion expressed at the Constitutional Convention that the phrase, quote, United States did not mean a consolidated American people or nation, and all the inferences in favor of a national government are overthrown. And in all the founding documents, by the way, the, the words United States are always in the plural, meaning the free, independent, and sovereign states are united in creating a, a compact or a confederacy to achieve certain ends. It, there was no such idea of something called the United States government, the, the monolithic leviathan that exists in Washington, D.C. today. And you have to understand that uh, the battle over the Constitution at the time was between the Jefferson, who, who saw the document as something that would bind government in chains. His famous phrase was, government needs to be bound by the chains of the Constitution. The Hamiltonians, totally the opposite. They saw this document as if it was properly interpreted by clever lawyers like themselves as a potential rubber stamp on anything the government would ever do. As long as you could get enough government judges on the Supreme Court who are like-minded to go along with rubber stamping everything, then it could be a useful document. And uh, one, of the historian, one of the historians of Hamilton, a biographer of Hamilton, uh, said this of him. He said, it seems certain that Hamilton, had he had his way, would have affixed a certain certificate of constitutionality to every last tax. Hamilton took a large view of the power of Congress to tax because he took a large view of the power to spend. And uh, that, of course, is where we are today. You, you know that statistic I mentioned from Judge Napolitano that the Supreme Court uh, did not uh, declare a single law of any kind unconstitutional from 1937 to 1995 that's the Hamiltonian system, rubber stamp, big government. Uh, well, one of the first things that was done was Hamilton himself started rewriting the history of the American founding by saying that the states were, in 1787 he said this, the states were merely artificial beings and were never sovereign. He said the nation, not the states, was sovereign. And so, you know, the, the way in which the Constitution was adopted was each state held a political convention and they voted up or down to ratify or not. If you ever read Article 7 of the U.S. Constitution, it explains how the Constitution is to become the law of the land. The states would ratify and go in or out. And of course, there were several states, like Rhode Island that's in North Carolina, that stayed out after the Constitution was actually in effect for a year, year and a half, and it took them a while to change their mind. And during that time, there was no proposal that I know of, or that anybody knows of, I think, uh, to invade New England, uh, uh, you know, Rhode Island, uh, bomb Providence and Newport into a smoldering ruins and murder their citizens by the thousands and, and sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic while they're doing it. Uh, they're, 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 it, was a, it was seen as being a voluntary union, not a union that uh, it was, uh, as Murray Rothbard once described it, as a Venus flytrap from which there would never be any escape. Uh, that was not the, the idea. They had just fought a revolution against that kind of system. The, the way in which Hamilton became tre the first Treasury Secretary is described in, the, in, the, in this uh, Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Hamilton uh, by Ron Chernow. And uh, he knew really nearly nothing about economics or finance. And, but at the very end of the revolution, he knew that, uh, uh, he knew so, that some very uh, 
influential and wealthy people in Philadelphia uh, who wanted to essentially run uh, the government. And so uh, uh, he wrote them letters and, and pretty much saying, I agree with you that we need uh, a centralized government with a central bank modeled after the Bank of England and, uh, and, uh, and high protective tariffs and, and subsidies for corporations, uh, pretty much. And these people put, got him put, uh, put in as Secretary of Treasury. They wrote George Washington and recommended Hamilton. So he really was sort of the water carrier for the Goldman Sachs of the day uh, uh, as Treasury Secretary, even though he admittedly knew next to nothing about finance himself. So he invented the idea of implied powers uh, he also was the first to invent the expansive interpretations of the general welfare and commerce clauses of the Constitution uh, to, to interpret the general welfare clause to mean just about anything the government would ever do. And so it was Hamilton who really laid the template for how to destroy the Constitution. And he had a lot of devoted followers, uh, the most important of which right after him was John Marshall, the Chief Justice from, I think, uh, uh, you know, he was appointed at the very, very end of the Adams administration. Jefferson became president in March of 1801, and John Adams became, uh, or not Adams, uh, John Marshall became chief justice for, I think, 36 years. And he was very, very devoted to uh, the Hamiltonian agenda. And uh, I guess he's most closely associated with the famous Marbury versus Madison decision that uh, planted into place the idea of judicial review of uh, legis federal legislation. Uh, the Constitution makes no mention of this. There's no judicial review in the Constitution. This was uh, John Marshall's idea that he, John Marshall, should be the final arbiter of what is and is not constitutional. Uh, and, and so uh, and he, got, he got away with it, okay? And so, but Jefferson himself, here's what Jefferson said about this. He says, uh, when he was asked about it, he said, this was in 1819. Thomas Jefferson said, well, my construction or my understanding of the Constitution is that each department, that is each branch of government, is truly independent of the others. And he's saying, wait a minute, we have three branches of government, not one, uh, not one, uh, and has an equal right to decide for itself what is the meaning of the Constitution in the cases submitted to its action. So the Jeffersonian view was that, okay, the Supreme Court can tell us their opinion, but their opinion is no more important than the opinion of the president or the Congress or the people of the states. Uh, Jefferson considered the 10th Amendment to be the cornerstone of the entire document of the Constitution, and that means the, the powers that are not delegated to the federal government are all reserved to the people and the states respectively, and they should also have a, uh, an equal say on what is and is not constitutional. The Jeffersonians thought it was insanity to allow everyone's liberty to be in the hands of five government lawyers given lifetime tenure. Well, they have fought a revolution in the name of liberty and then put everybody's liberty in the hands of five government lawyers with lifetime tenure? Uh, that's the system we have. That, that's the nationalist argument, uh, uh, which, and it's a system we have now, but that was never the intent. 